I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United Uh, today's invitation will be offered by John Scott. As we sit in our comfortable room today, uh, let's think about all of those whose lives uh, have been threatened and continue to be threatened with the bad weather in the Midwest. Please bow your heads. Great creator, we all recall in our past the times, the places, and people that have given us instruction in life. That life that you have given us compels us as Rotarians to be fully committed to help pass on to future generations that knowledge so generously provided to us. Today, it is obvious that current issues and circumstances challenge educators to be a greater degree than ever before. We pray for their endurance and dedication today's, to today's students, because after all is said and done, it is about the students and their success. We pray that all of our educators, administrators, mentors, com community leaders continue to serve to inspire their students and that they know that they can always count on the Rotary Club of Worcester to give as much support as possible to ensure their success. Thank you for this meal. Bless the skillful hands that prepared it for us. May it serve to nourish our bodies to do your work here on earth. Amen. Okay. Welcome. And finally, spring has sprung. So it was a beautiful weekend. Hopefully you guys got to enjoy it. I so much was actually in a volleyball complex coaching volleyball team. So that's where I was at, not enjoying the sunshine. So, but we did win. So well, that, that, that's the plus side to it. So um, I'm going to give you lots of wisdom today. Today is National Zipper Day. <laughs> All right. So on this day, 1913 is when the patent for the modern zipper was issued. The day celebrates when uh, something that we often do not think about may they, um, may automatically take for granted. So there you go. It's National Zipper Day. I, I won't bore you with the rest of it. So who all invented it and all that kind of stuff. But Greg Long, thank you so much for hosting us last week at your museum. Um, those that were there, I bet you guys um, that haven't been there, um, and those that were there for the first time, um, were obviously, uh, hopefully, were amazed. It was it's a beautiful uh, museum and lots of information. So you did an amazing job hosting us. So thank you. And if you haven't been there, make sure you schedule a tour with Greg Long and get over there and see it. Um, this is really hot, so yeah, you don't have to get very close to it. Okay. Um, the other thing, um, some of your tables do have a QR code on there. Um, so um, tradition, you know, we, we kind of collect the money on the table that we, um, at the end of the year, that's kind of what the money is used to pay our um, wonderful cooks um, their bonus. Um, so we are not getting rid of that. You can continue to put the money in the middle of the table, Greg, I promise. Not going away. Um, but if you want another way to pay um, is a QR code. Um, so this is, if you're like me that don't carry cash, um, this is an opportunity to, to do it. So if you'd rather do it like a monthly time, a weekly time, a one time, that's great. Um, but um, that said, if you don't have one on your table right now, um, we will get you one as the weeks come along. So just an FYI. And we'll share more information of why we're doing this and in, in the next couple of weeks. So with that, um, past president, um, Ms. Kim Matheris, filling in for uh, Secretary May. 
Okay. Be honest, how many of you reached to check your zippers just a minute ago? <laughs> All right. Bonnie Hall has our traveling microphone. And we will start with Joel Montgomery as a guest. My guest is the Deputy Director of Education for the City of Jersey. Mike Davidson has a guest. Good afternoon. My guest, Mike Patel, is the owner of the uh, present CEO of the Unity Pharmacy that now has two uh, units in the building. So it's good to be here. Lynette Madsen has a guest. Hi, my guest is one of the great educators who talks about her in her invitation, Jillian Lee, Department of the Writing and American Public Works. And our exchange students will share an update for the week. By the end of March, no, that made it into March. Um, it was invitational practice on Saturday, and since it's like an invitation now, I would just jump to like the class, so it's funny that she's coming back. I'm not that fast. She didn't want to update in whatever, so she's there to help the player in whatever it is. And it gave only two or the one of the hurdles. Hurdles, hurdles, hurdles. <laughs> and I did that, and I sat down for like seven hours straight into the sun. It was really nice. This weekend, I almost got away. I went to our theater, our theater of science. This is my first time doing science. It was it's, it was easier than I thought. So, yeah, <laughs> I would be fun with Kaiden. On Sunday, I went to the Kennedy University band, and we played music with the Kennedy University students. So, they had to be appointed to be here in the Kennedy University. One player is from the I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he's also actually student. Of course, I introduced myself. I am, I am a senior, I'm a robot, I'm a teacher, and he was like, oh, me too, uh, oh, I'm from Peru. I felt so beautiful that I didn't expect that I could be become a teacher in the university. So we thought about our country, what language do Peru people speak? They can speak Spanish. And yeah, we talked about you in the day, and yeah, that was a very good experience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. I appreciate it. We have um, a new member here for her first initial, official meeting. So, Nicole Williams, let's let's come forward, do a welcome. Nicole is the executive director of the Mental Health and Recovery Board of Wayne and Holmes Counties. And she, her Rotarian sponsor is Tiffany Kessner. Welcome. Hey, okay. President Courtney has a guest to introduce and then Lee King has an announcement. Perfect. Um, my guest is Tyler Corbett, and he's um, the American Family um, Insurance Agency here in Worcester. So, welcome. Awesome, what do you do? I got a I got a package here. I'll talk about in a little bit, but <laughs> talking flags. So. Those of you that uh, have subscriptions with our club, that's great. Just make a uh, plea out there. If you do not have a subscription, please do so by May 3rd. Uh, Cheryl Boyer is going to be doing routes here the next week. Um, the reason I'm up here is we could use some more spring marker help. So if you want to be able to perform some graffiti, 
in the city of Worcester or Smithville, um, we could use some spring markers to locate markers to help our, sub our subscribers and our community members find the flag. So Russell Robertson is handling that. Brent Rice handed that over to him. So we're looking for another 20 spring markers to go out and find sleeves and mark sleeves. So if you like the paint, you can put uh, paint on the curb or on the road. So thank you. All right, well, welcome to all of our guests. Um, we hope today you enjoy today's program. At this time, I would like to welcome Tammy Curtis to the podium for her classification talk. <laughs> Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. My name is Tammy Cruz. And before I forget, I need to apologize. Um, when Greg became my sponsor last year, um, little did I know that I would be struggling with a knee injury that would take me out pretty much the entire year. And this is my first meeting back in several months from just having total knee replacement. So, hmm, so to come back and have to do a classification with me. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about you. If you know me at all, you know I wrote something up, but I won't even use it because it's my life and I know what it is. So just to give you a little bit about myself, um, I came from a very humble beginning. My parents were divorced early on and there were five kids and we shared a house with just two bedrooms. So we were taught very early on that we don't have a lot, but we always have more than someone. So my mom instilled in us at a very young age that you have to help everyone. You don't ever be afraid to humble yourself and help someone that's less fortunate. Now that might sound really, really sweet and go, oh, but what that caused me is I got into more fights when I was in school than anybody that I know, because I always felt like if there was someone that needed saved or if there was an underdog, I, I needed to help them. So um, I got the nickname early on Cassius Clay. I didn't know who Cassius Clay was until I became a junior, and then they changed it to Cassius Copley because that was my middle name. So I'm not proud of that, but I tell you that because I know that there's some of you in this room that already know that story. Um, the other good thing about growing up in a small community is um, I actually met and fell in love with my high school sweetheart, and we just celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary. Yeah, so I was pretty fortunate. 15, fell in love with that boy. <laughs> um, yeah, he wasn't ready for what he got. <laughs> so we met in 81, we got married in 85, and had our twins in 87. Uh, we've been blessed for 43 years. Matt just retired a few years ago from the Worcester Police Department after 30, almost 33 years of law enforcement. And I say that because we did that together. When he went off to the academy, I was raising two twins by myself that were just a little about, about three years old. So he was gone for 13 weeks. And I thought I saw Steve in here. So he probably remembers how hard that was. Um, but he did it. So we retired at, after 33 years. Um, because we tried for so long to have children, um, I decided to be a stay-at-home mom. I did not want to leave those babies after it took me so long to get pregnant. So I did not go back to work and even start my career until they were five years old. I was fortunate because I became a um, paralegal in corporate law at Rubbermaid. Absolutely loved it. I thought that was going to be my calling forever. Well, then we all know sometimes things change, companies move. Um, and I love law. So I became a deputy sheriff, which was kind of uh, unique because Matt was in law enforcement. I was a paralegal. Why wouldn't I become a corrections officer? So I did. Um, the Wayne County Sex Offender Registration that's actually started in Wayne County, I started that. So it was a lot of research, writing grants, getting equipment, but I fell in love with it. I thought, oh my gosh, being a deputy is incredible. And then I uh, started working with Medway, loved being an agent too, that whole excitement of being in bars, pretending like I was drinking and drinking water and watching people. And we did that for several years. And so Matt and I were both on duty at midnight, working the midnight shift. And I was following someone from Georgia 
who had a warrant out for a murder. And my radio went dead. And there's Mac. This is before they had the little iPhones and the little watches that we couldn't communicate. And he told me that night when my radio went silent, he said, you're not gonna do that anymore. <clears throat> so I had to find a new career. So I started, I became a professional grant writer. And um, lo and behold, I liked it, it was good. So the, all the computers that we have in our cruisers now in Wayne County, I worked um, with the late Ralph Linsalata and we worked with the Attorney General, Betty Montgomery, and we secured laptops for all of the cruisers in Wayne County so that we could all communicate. So again, I wasn't really working with law enforcement, but I still had my hands in it just a little bit. Well, part of working with law enforcement, um, you have to do a lot of campaigning to make sure that your money is coming in. And in addition to writing grants, I started doing event planning. Who knew? Background in marketing, I do event planning. Um, loved it though, which led me to my job today. Um, I've had quite a few jobs. Some of the people that I've worked are in this room today. I've learned so much, Bonnie, you're sitting there. I've learned so much from you. Good friend now. Um, but now I'm the, actually the director of two event centers here in Wayne County, Greystone Event Center and White Oak. Um, just a few months ago, we had our president, Brian Sayre, come and share a little bit about Sayre Hospitality. Wonderful company. We own eight companies now, and we are extremely blessed. Um, in our downtime, um, Matt and I like to volunteer. I've served on several nonprofit boards, um, served on several uh, boards just to give back. A lot of times we do it quietly behind the scenes. Um, one that was not so quiet was the Triway Board of Education for 12 years and that was done and that was a lot of work. And after 12 years, I said that was enough of that. Um, so now that Matt's retired, we do a lot of traveling. We do, um, we bought a camper and we have our twin daughters and our three grandchildren that keep us busy every week. And like you, we got up at 4, 3.30 on Saturday morning left for Columbus at 4.20 and got home at 20 till 8 that night because our oldest granddaughter, I think, had 13 games that day. Um, she didn't come home a winner, but they only lost, I think, two games. But we were exhausted. Our dogs were exhausted from being in their cage that long. But that's what we do now. So we work and we spend time with our kids and our grandchildren, and we love life. Um, I think I mentioned Greg at the beginning of this, but... He was after me for multiple, multiple years to become a member and just didn't have time. You're sitting there going, oh, you did. every time I saw him, I'm like, I, I promise I'm going to. So I do thank you. And he's been so patient with me because I've not been the dedicated material like I wanted to, but I'm going to. So is there any questions? I'm pretty much an open book. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Danny. All right, up next we have Jill Monroe. She's going to introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Ann McCall, the newest president of the College of Worcester, who joined our community in July of 2023. President McCall's distinguished career has been marked by a long standing dedication to intellectual freedom and innovating higher education through collaboration. Before assuming her current role, President McCall served as the Provost and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs at Xavier University of Louisiana. During her tenure there, she spearheaded transformative initiatives, securing high profile grants and increasing their pipeline and programmatic partnerships, as well as establishing research institutes institutes such as the Oxner Xavier Institute of Health Equity and Research. Notably, Dr. McCall also led the creation of new academic programs tailored to emerging fields, professional opportunities, and student interests. Prior to her tenure at Xavier, Dr. McCall held significant leadership positions at Binghamton University and the University of Denver. And during a formative period at Tulane University, she held a faculty position in French, directed the Women's Studies Program, and served as an associate dean during the Hurricane Katrina recovery. Dr. McCall is a dedicated teacher and scholar of French literature and chairs the steering com committee for the US section of Scholars at Risk, supporting academic freedom around the world. 
Beyond her intellectual pursuits and love of the arts, she's also an avid swimmer and walker and can generally be convinced to take a walking meeting at any time of year. I'm guessing a day like today would be perfect. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce President Anne. Hello, it's so good to see all of you out there today. Thank you for your kind introduction, Jill. And uh, I was giggling a little bit to myself when she was doing it because they changed the script. They used to always say I was the 13th president. People would always go like this. And um, and then I would explain that's okay. Um, Davy Concepcion was always my favorite player growing up. He was number 13. <laughs> But then they, I think they pulled the line when I started telling people it was, I had been told that it was Taylor Swift's favorite number. <laughs> and, and then that just was, I think they saw things getting out of hand. So now I'm just the newest president. Anyway, special thanks to my sponsor, Greg Long. Uh, Greg, I took the book out and left it on the counter. So I still owe it to you. And um, uh, Courtney and everyone who is a Rotarian, thank you so much for having me and welcoming my husband, Robbie Pilat, and me to uh, to the college and into the town. I understand you're getting a twofer from me today because this is also my classification talk. And, you know, I went to my first experience of a classification talk and of a rotary talk was two weeks ago. And I thought, oh no, I don't have a PowerPoint. I don't sing. I haven't played the piano in years <laughs> and I haven't started tap dancing yet. What am I going to do? <laughs> and so I'm really digging deep for this to make sure that we're all okay for this. So I'm, Jill shared a few things about my uh, professional trajectory. I wanted to add just a few about my personal trajectory <laughs> and then jump into the College of Worcester, which I was uh, invited here originally for. So I did grow up in Cincinnati, Ohio. So as a Buckeye, although not a Buckeyes fan, I was a Bearcats fan. Um, but a Buckeye nonetheless. My parents were both from Yonkers, New York. There's a cast of thousands of Morrises in New York, uh, Morrises and McCalls from Rochester to Long Island. And at any given time, some of my relatives are behaving potentially badly, but uh, you know, we try to stay out of the news. Um, but anyway, my parents had moved to DC when they got married. My father taught at Georgetown. And uh, then we moved to Cincinnati when I was in early grade school. And my dad loved to talk about the fact that he earned more money toward retirement in one year at the University of Cincinnati than in 11 at Georgetown. That was his favorite favorite thing. So uh, a quick anecdote, just of being a new Buckeye back in the day, my parents put on the news. I still remember this. We had just arrived. Al Shadokati's six report was on. And you may remember there were a lot more traffic deaths back then. And so they, in the Tri-City area, they would say, you know, we had whatever number of deaths, traffic deaths in the Tri-City this past weekend, five Hoosiers, four Bluegrass, three Buckeyes, something like that. And I went to bed and I couldn't sleep. I was in such distress. And I eventually came downstairs and I remember sobbing to my mom who was asking me why I would have come downstairs. And I said, I did not want to be a dead Buckeye. <laughs> there we go. So for those of you who know Cincinnati, I grew up in Clifton, where I attended Clifton Elementary School, then Walnut Hills High School. The best part about Walnut Hills High School was not the excellent education that folks always talk about. It was that we were a six-year high school, which meant that from seventh grade on, we benefited from the special deal that kids only in high school got in the city which was that if you had an A or A minus average in the spring quarter, you got two free tickets to three different sets of games of the Reds. And uh, so the trick was to get your average up and to be very good friends with people who were very good in class and who did not like baseball. So how not to become a fan then, you know? It's just, it's just not possible otherwise. Um, and so, and by the way, you could get out of school for the first, for the opening game of the year if you showed your tickets blows my mind when I think about it now. Anyway, grew up very happily, last anecdote from youth. Um, so all these New Yorker relatives, and we were very proud, happy Cincinnatians, right? And of course it was more, people used to think more before calling people who were far away then, right? 
So every few months we would get calls from all the relatives wherever in New York. And it would always start with, what time is it out there? And we would say, same time as it is for you. And then they would unfailingly say, no, it can't be. And we would say, oh, but it is. And then we'd go from there. This went on throughout my entire growing up. Okay, last thing I would tell you about myself personally is that one of the best things about my father's specialty, so he was a medievalist, was that he needed to study documents that were not online yet the way they are today. The documents he needed to study as a medievalist were at the University of Oxford, at the British Museum, at Paris, at the French National Library, at the Vatican Library. And so, um, meanwhile, my mother was an avid proponent of international education. And by the way, dot, 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 they went to the Peace Corps after retirement to Turkmenistan. But anyway, so my father's biggest duty was to write grants. Where is our grant writer? Right over there, <laughs> without you. Um, so that all six of us, I had three siblings who were all 18 months apart, could go on the trip, trips. And so that radically changed my life. You know, spending two summers in grade school in England, um, a year in preschool in Rome, Yes, Mr. Mariola. And, um, and uh, high school, eight months in Paris. And so we were just really fortunate that way. My father, who had, by the way, served in, uh, not in Korea, but he was in the Korean conflict, always talked about how he much preferred following my mother's orders than his sergeant's orders. <laughs> hers was for us to go travel. So that really affected my view on education a lot. I did everything I could to make sure that in college I could go junior year abroad. I studied in Strasbourg and then went back for 10 years for graduate school. I lived in France and lived in Spain, started my own family, and then came back to America. So now we get more to uh, my, my career. What Jill said, basically I've been in higher education for over 30 years at a variety of kinds of institutions very different from each other. And at each stage along the way, when I wasn't at a liberal arts college, I would found a group inside of the larger university that pretty much did the function of what a liberal arts college would do or support the things that Apex does, for example, at Worcester. And finally, I thought, you know, instead of trying to invent those things at another place, why not just go work at one? It would be a lot simpler. And so I cannot tell you how proud I am to have been chosen to lead the College of Worcester at this time, such a storied institution doing important work. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's really a joy every morning to wake up and to know that we're here in such a warm and welcoming, innovative, growing community um, that thinks hard about trying to be the best in our own genre of community and of college that we are. Not trying to be anything other than ourselves, but trying to be the very best of that in a forward-looking way. So to move to the college and give you a short update before I take uh, questions, uh, I'm going to leave time for questions. In a few short words, number one, our college is doing well and you can be proud of it. I'm going to give you a couple of external indicators and um, and one internal ed indicator. So, you know, everybody loves to hate uh, surveys and rankings when they like us and when they don't. But it is worth knowing that this year, in the biggest ranking that all of us love to hate, U.S. News and World Report, there was a lot of volatility of colleges and universities that went way up or down, like by 30, 35 colleges because they changed the way to count success. And what it was really saying, the changes were meant to say, if you're educating an extraordinarily elite, well, population that has always had everything that it possibly needs, and then those are the only people you admit, you get, you'll get a tiny bit of a handicap because it, it shouldn't be that hard actually with everything that's coming in. And so whew, there was a lot that was coming up and down. We moved up one point, one school. 
And I and I like that we went up one rather than go down one, but fundamentally what that survey said was we are who we are. The College of Worcester has continued to embrace a mission that it has had for over 150 years that we do in the most authentic way possible. Second survey, the Princeton Review, is one that I particularly enjoy because it's based on student survey. So it changes a lot year to year based on what students care about that given year. And ours, um, but the categories in which we achieve distinction are very similar year to year. So very high ranked in senior serve in senior projects, in close relationships with faculty, in um, undergraduate libraries, in how many, how much you have to work for your classes. We also rank really high on a, a ranking called where fun comes to die um, because the students study so much. Last thing I'll give you is something from ourselves, and we have not publicized this adequately to all of our community. There's a big way of measuring success in college, which is by what happens after college, right? As it should be. Now, some of that is challenging to gauge right after somebody graduates because they may go to graduate school or they may be trying to figure out what their next move is, or they may have started applying for jobs too late. All the things that happen with 22 year olds. What is measured, what we are asked to measure is what students are doing within six months of graduation. Percentage of students who are working in a position considered near their major or in graduate school. What is the College of Worcester's percentage? 90%. Ninety-six percent. So we want to be ninety-eight percent, right? But think about that a little bit. In a liberal arts education, it usually does take more time after college to enter that area uh, of um, next phase of your life. College of Worcester, no, it's actually pretty much right away. And that says a lot about several people who are in the room the work of our faculty and the kind of community of rise and of excellence within freedom that we have on our campus. Okay, second thing I mentioned is, of course, we're in a turbulent sector. I'm not gonna go too far in it or I'm going to uh, speak over a question, but we're not immune to those challenges. So there were a lot of fewer children born about 20 years ago than, um, than previously. So the population going to college is smaller. We also have fewer people who have enough money to go to college today. So those people who had children tend to have less money than children than 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And of course, we have a lot of higher education uh, in the press for all sorts of other reasons that, um, that create a uh, sometimes a negative perception of higher education. So that's our job to speak our value, to let folks understand how important it is the work that we do, the value that comes to our community from it, as well as the value for the individuals who are fortunate enough to get this education. Okay, so why should we be optimistic about the future besides the fact that um, we're good at what we do? Clearly, the results are there. It's because we're going to dig in as we're looking toward our future, we're digging into our past to fuel our future. So number one, we have always been a site for free inquiry, radically free, disturbingly free inquiry. That's not a new thing, it's actually a Worcester thing. And if you ask me a question about it, I will tell you more about what happened in 1923 when President Wisher ran against um, William Jennings Bryan, the moderator of the Presbyterian of America, okay? And by the way, we should won. But when the college between 1881 and this occurrence in 1923 started worrying about what was going on in the teaching of new topics like evolution, political science, e economics, those were radical topics at the time. Right? Do you know what the college's response was officially through its board of trustees? 
we need to spend more money on scientific instrumentation so that we can learn what the truth is. That's always where we've been. So if there's a topic that's new and that's controversial, it's our history to be involved in it and to look at it unfettered. And that is a strength today. Secondly, we've always been global, always. We were founded largely with the participation in the outlook of Presbyterian missionaries. As early as 1875, when we had seven graduates, five of them immediately left for uh, missionary work in Asia, Africa, and South America. We had housing on our campus, as many of you know, for returning missionaries. We had a prep school for the children of missionaries who needed to a year or two before they came to the college. Last fun fact about this. In 1915, if I'm remembering correctly, this is from the writings of an alum in 1930-something. There were 100 students, American students, at the college who had been raised in China or India. And the college was, according to this book, distinguished for teaching the children of Asian-educated Americans. That started when you think about where did our international students come from at the college, right? That's such a strong part of our identity. It comes from the Presbyterian scholars who in, eight, who in 1960 complained to President Copeland that we only had Americans from those countries rather than people from those countries themselves. So our tradition of having a strong cohort of international students Today, we have students from 47 countries in our very small college, right? Comes from very, very deep roots. And then last but not least, you will find not surprising, given all of this, that we've always been at the edge of curricular innovation. If it's new, if it looks important, if it looks like something that might give something to the future, we want to be there. So, Question for all of you. What do you think our biggest department is right now? Our department with the most majors. Yes, sir. But it's, but it's because it's math, computers, and data sciences. So data sciences is our most recent uh, major in that department. And it's, it's about to beat out computer science. 20% of our majors, our declared majors, are in that department alone. Now, that doesn't mean we've given up the humanities, uh, languages, philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. But you see where I'm going with this, right? Wherever knowledge is taking people, we're going there now. And as an example of that bridge, the newest minor proposal that I've heard is something I have to tell you I don't understand what it is but it's computational humanities. So you can be proud of the college. You should know that we are also eager to deepen the interactions and render more robust the links that you know, inseparably tie us with the community. We want to be good neighbors. We want to uh, in increase programs like our wonderful health ambassador program that we have with a uh, community hospital, tutor in schools, participate in sustainability uh, initiatives, do collaborative research with, I learned the OERDC and then they go and change the name. I don't know that in the <laughs> CFAES, okay, but we, we are there. So we're finishing the new strategic planning process that will be out within about six months. And so know that we are eager to use our own process and to come back to many of you in this room with ideas, questions, and really humble um, desire to listen to what you know about us that you know I certainly don't know after nine months and that the college may not even be seeing in itself right now. So thank you so much for having me, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions if there's time. Thank you, President McCall. Can you touch a little bit on, on the uh, 
fewer number of students. I, I'm hearing that 325 and 426 is crucial for our small colleges mm -hmm. because we really have a small number of students applying to college. Is that, is that what you're hearing? What is the college doing about it? Okay, thank you. So uh, two or three things about that. First of all, that's true, but in a way it's old news for Ohio. So Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, we were hit by this earlier than other states. All right, so the enrollment cliff that people talk about, it's already here, it's been here. Um, this year we did welcome a smaller class in, we also have higher retention. So we haven't completely made sense yet of the extent to which um, we may want to try to counteract this trend for a few years or ride with it, repair some of our aging resident halls while the classes are a little bit smaller, right? And then and um, and be poised for growth afterwards. But in a, on a practical level, what it also means is um, uh, recruiting very actively in different ways locally, in different places nationally, and continued internationally. So when I say locally, I'm really meaning at the state level, but very much with a focus on our region. You know, the state of Ohio has increased uh, its commitment to in-state students and helping students with tuition. And so we've honored that commitment of the state with our own uh, for priority financial aid packaging and meeting a full need of all Ohio students. We're not wealthy enough to meet aid of every student but we make that commitment for our Ohio students. In terms of uh, national recruiting, you have to go where the people are. And so we need to increase our recruiting presence in states that are growing. We've always been national. You know, we have at this point about, I always forget the exact number, but somewhere between 35 and 38% are in state. And then the rest are from out of state or international. So we have to really make an effort to shape that class for success. And then when you're recruiting, when you're well known for recruiting in international circles, you also pay a lot of attention to the different reports that come out from the major organizations about the countries that are up, the countries that are down, et cetera. And so you move around your resources for that. That's on the tactic side of how to get students. It also means making sure that everybody knows that we have a, an up-to-date curriculum, that, that our students are successful afterwards. You know, our, our education is expensive. Our IS program that many of you know us for, it's eight, that's worth 18 employees all on its own. 18 FTEs, if we say at work, right? Um, we have performing arts that's strong, and we have the sciences. Those are three very expensive areas of education. So we also can't just lower prices dramatically because the cost is high. So we have to find the students. We have to make sure that people know about us, that they know that we are worthy of their investment of funds, right? And then also activate all of our friends and, and uh, alumni to help us with that. And we're redoing all of our marketing and communication to make our value proposition much more visible to the world. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, can you give us a thought today or status update on the college of Worcester Preschool? I was waiting for that, and you're even using the new word, we say now preschool. So as you know, uh, we had to put a pause on the nursery school right before it was to open. Um, in the summer, and I realized that that was very, well, that was a very hard thing to do, and I'm, it was a very hard thing for the community to accept. And um, while it's not at all a joking matter, I have to tell you that one of my children is an early childhood educator, and so I would hear it at home as well as uh, walking around town. But sometimes you just have to do certain things, and uh, that's just the way it is. We kept on the director, though, who had been moving to Worcester from across the country when we had to not open, decided not to open. And she had been working all year long with the provost, uh, community partners, et cetera, to put together a business plan 
that the board approved, I want to say two weeks ago. And so we are going to reopen it as a pilot year. Now, this is really important. One class, three hours of instruction rather than two and a half, a little before care and a little after care, but so far, no afternoon session. Um, and we have to make the class by June 30th. So if you know people who are thinking of putting a child in preschool and would love to have their child in a wonderful learning environment, nature-based play curriculum, the time is now to contact Tessa Hammond at, at the College of Worcester and to put in um, a deposit. So it is as a pilot. After I say that because after we had to not open the college, when we were looking at other the college, the preschool, we did discover afterwards that the nursery school had been losing money for several years. And we are not in a position basically to have our undergraduate students footing the gap on the on the preschool. So the preschool has to, doesn't have to make money but it has to stand on its own two feet financially. And that's why the board put in the, the June 30th deadline to hold us to financial discipline. But I'm very excited and I really hope it will open. I, this is more of a comment. I just wanted to thank you for continuing with the experiential learning for the students. It's so important to our organization. You know, we've been through many AMRIC projects and have had any like fellows. And I thought maybe you could mention that people who may not know about it. Thank you. I cut that because uh, there was there was you know I had to make some decisions. I appreciate the question. Um, so one of the secrets to our success is this very high touch, in depth experiential learning that our students, no matter their major or minor, um, can engage in, and many do through the Apex office. Don't try to learn what Apex means but it's just Apex, plan, academic planning, experiential careers, there we go, something. Um, and it, the, in these programs, which are similar to graduate NSF funded programs I've seen at Research One universities, we pair our students who are interested, who have a variety of skills, typically a lot in math, business economics, and in um, computer science and data science, but not only, with businesses in town and not-for-profits in town that need a project done and that are prepared to have college students with a faculty advisor work on it primarily in the summer and come out with a product. So we have students who've done numerous, uh, we've, we've done lots and lots of projects with progressive insurance, Good year. Um, of course, I can't think of the other names right now. United Way. United. Well, yeah. So then I was going to say, and not for profits like United Way, uh, schools. The list. It's a very long list. And so I went to their debrief session in October, and it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Um, I, I remember one project where the students uh, were. They were so excited. They were saying we were paid to experiment with different AI programs for a law firm about which ones would do better kinds of research one way or another way. Was that your firm, sir? Um, think about it. I mean, it's like putting kids in a sandbox, right? But in terms of the skills and the resume building work, again, it's not by magic that we have such a high placement rate afterwards. And it's a really great way for us to be active in the community. By the way, these projects are funded by our donors, by our alumni largely, um, who see in that a great opportunity for our students and for the town. Any other questions? No, she said no, we're done with Sorry, questions. I wish, okay. I wish. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> And we really appreciate your time with us today. And we'd like to present you with this rendition of the rotary wheel with the four-way test on the back made locally with the fun students of the village network. So thank, thank you, you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And welcome aboard. We really are excited to have you join us. And Tammy, thank you for your classification talk today. You did wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, next week we have a presentation. Um, we'll be forgiving medical debt locally, Westminster uh, Presbyterian Church, the 150th anniversary mission project. Um, and thank you to all you guests. Um, we hope you enjoyed our presentation today and you're welcome back next week or anytime. Um, and I think with that, we stand adjourned. So thank you. Not very good.